Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And thank you all for coming to our fourth breakfast in the Power of Diversity programme and very kindly hosted by Willis. You can't have failed to notice where you are um, and you are in the heart of the world of insurance. Thank you very much indeed for hosting this, Dominic, and we will hear from you momentarily. How many of you, of you have been to Power of Diversity breakfast before? Quite a few of you, so you don't need much introduction from me. That's good. That's more time for discussion. We have been making quite a lot of progress, um, and I will update you as to where we're at. Um, Charlotte has been collecting your thoughts, ideas, best practice, what's worked, what hasn't, um, and is pulling it together on a website which will be accessible very shortly. Um, you'll hear more from her on that. So that is one of the legacies. Another, another piece she's been working on with recruitment um, agencies is a, um, a voluntary code of conduct that looks a bit like the one for board appointments, uh, but would work at the, at the middle, middle management level. Um, another one um, is a um, following my theory that we have to get to not the captains of industry who get it, but those in the middle of the organizations who are very busy doing the work, pulling in the next job, and trying to go home at night. Um, this is the big middle. Uh, the, the, there are a couple of strands of work there, one of which is to create a network of um, diversity champions across organizations. This, is, this started with the Audacity Conference last week, encouraging these leaders of the, the leaders of affinity groups like your women's network and your LGBT network to talk to each other and across organizations and to grow their networks to be more audacious on this agenda. CITY in audacity is in red and bold. Um, the, um, the other, the other piece of work that we're starting on is a social media uh, program. Um, we have amongst us a social media expert um, who has uh, worked uh, with um, oh the European Commission as well as a bunch of others to to get people to focus on a particular issue. Um, lastly, how long is this? How long do we have left? Well, I finish my mayoralty in November. Uh, the Senior Leaders Forum of the Power of Diversity. These are the, the 36 organizations that came together uh, and their logos are on the three buses that run around uh, London. Um, they, um, they said, well, what's going to happen after your year? The answer is that the City Corporation um, is keen that it should continue um, and, to pr and, and to provide a fl platform. And the town clerk, who's the chief executive, um, has um, offered to lead that work personally from a city corporation point of view uh, to help it to, to continue. So that is fantastic news. The, the, I suppose the message that um, I'd like to leave with you is that we, we are all the time receiving expressions of interest. I have people who come to talk about the diversity and inclusion agenda, particularly after the Inclusive Capital, Capitalism Conference in May, um, at which uh, Christine Lagarde and Bill Clinton, Mark Carney, made such a, a, a powerful statement about, uh, about inclusiveness as well as diversity, of how we, how we move that on and actually grow the power of diversity movement. So whenever somebody comes to see me, um, I, I, I include them in, in the group. Uh, if you know of more organizations who are, who are interested in this agenda, who are struggling, uh, would like to be part of this, uh, the more energy we get into it, the more likely are, we are to get the wave, wave up the beach. So a big thank you to Charlotte for um, being 
uh, everything that I could ask of her um, and being everywhere and talking to everyone. Uh, the, with that, let me hand over to Penny Haslam, who will be our chair for this morning. She's been in journalism for over 20 years and has been a regular business presenter on BBC Breakfast and the BBC News Channel. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. How wonderful to see you all this morning. And it's nice not to have to get up quite so early as I used to in my previous life as a morning presenter, all perky at 3 a.m. It was a lion today, for definite. Um, I'm going to ask the panel to take their seats, please, if you don't mind. Any will do. That's fine. So why don't you get up on there? So yes, I am a business journalist, but what you may not know about me is my passion for diversity. I run an organisation at the moment that aims to get more women on the airwaves. Women do turn up on TV and radio, often as victims and case studies, very rarely as experts. And um, I'm sure you will have seen statistics and figures that show that for every four men on TV and radio, just one woman is invited on. But the diversity issue does not just stop at gender, as you all well know. And so let's get into some ideas about definitions. I'm not sure whether to come and join you in the seat there or not. I feel a bit hemmed in. I may or may not. I may just free form around. There we go. Yes, I'll, in, I'll do some sort of like uh, mastermind sort of idea there. Change halfway through. We could change halfway through, exactly. Thank you. So first of all, on the far uh, left there, yes, that's right, is Carol Rosati. He's a director at Harvey Nash, a recruitment firm. But that isn't just all you do. You're headhunters, you're outsourcing, you're global, you're 4,000 people. So not only are you people within Harvey Nash, people uh, that uh, Harvey Nash seek, also, the diversity and inclusion issues are there, which we'll get into in a little while. In the middle is Dominic Cassley, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Willis here. Or oh, I've told it's Willis Holdings Group, but that's not. It's just Willis. <laughs> We're so friendly here, aren't we? It's just Willis. That's fabulous. And on the end is Richard Holmes, the Chief Executive Officer of Europe for Standard Chartered. Good morning, and Good morning. thank you very much for joining us. The empty chair is actually for Trevor James, who's from Morrison Forster, who can't attend today. Some of you may know Trevor. He's been called away on business to San Francisco, I believe. Oh, that's just terrible, isn't it? <laughs> well, at least he's escaping the London heat. So let's get started then. Um, we, we have some really interesting figures here which I want to just share with you for a moment. And, that, and this is great news. This is thumbs up, OK? This is the thumbs up figure. 84% of employees agreed that their organisations made a commitment from the very top to create a diverse and inclusive working environment. If it was later on the day and we'd had a drink, we'd probably go, way, wouldn't we? The second figure, 87% 87% of those people surveyed in the city didn't think their firm's efforts on diversity and inclusion were having an impact on them at all. Ooh, <laughs> OK. So the figures are really interesting. There's a disconnect there between the will at the top, the will in the middle, and the actual feeling and sense of how that's playing out. So first of all, Carol, give us your definition of diversity and inclusion, because it's different for everybody, and it's different for each organisation. So what's your short and brief answer to the definition of diversity? <coughs> Well, it's funny, I mean, one of, the, one of the things I always say to people is, is although I run a board network for women, diversity, diversity for me is about all kinds of diversity in the widest possible sense. And in that, everyone should be included in it. Um, it does mean different things to different people. Um, and really, it's, it's, for me, my mission, I guess, is to get everybody to talk about it so that they're very, very clear about the messaging and about how they understand the impact of true diversity and inclusion. Okay. And Dominic? For us, I think this is a very simple issue. This is about talent. Right? Um, we are basically an organization made up of people. Uh, and if we are not diverse in our sourcing and development and promotion of talent of all sorts, we're failing, failing to bring the best to the, to the top. Uh, and. Uh, so for us, this is not, and I think the only way, by the way, that diversity has sustainability as an issue is if it just becomes, well, this is the way, I'm sorry to use this term, you make money. And if you have in an organization the best people and draw from the broadest lot, you will have the best people and you will be more successful. And if we ever dislocate that, we'll run into, run into, run aground. So for us, 
This is about um, the lifeblood of the organization, talent. Okay, talent, right. diverse talent. And it doesn't matter that it's diverse, it's talent. It's talent. So if you lock off from certain areas of the population, you're locking off from the Absolutely. talent. Absolutely. That, that's what you're saying. Very simple. Okay. And Richard? Um, you mentioned San Francisco, just. It reminded me, late 70s, I moved there um, working for an accounting firm, and the managing partner said, I don't know how it works over there in England, but in the US here, there's only two motivators in life, money and fear. <laughs> which I thought was kind of interesting. So about 20 years later, I was in New York um, at a town hall, and a question was asked of a senior manager, how should you treat people? And his answer was, you should treat people the way you would like to be treated, which was a little more enlightened. But I have sort of come to realize that's the wrong answer. You, you treat people the way they want to be treated. So to me, diversity is about recognizing people are different, embracing that difference, and then treating them accordingly. And we, we operate in 70 countries around the world. Um, we have to have a diverse workforce to understand the cultural differences. Um, so diversity and inclusion for us is it's multifaceted. It's not just race or gender. Uh, and I can go into some more detail of how we run it. But it, uh, as Dominic says, it's fundamental, I think, in attracting the right talent, a diverse talent, to deal with a diverse client base. And it's just at the core of what we do. Okay, so it's at the core of what you do. <coughs> Quite short. Um, it's at the core of what you do. How, you're, you're, you run your show, okay? You run your show, you're pretty high up we as try. well. We try. It's great. <laughs> you're really invested in this idea. Presumably you're sitting in this chair, these chairs because of that. But how do you, how would you sell this idea? to others? Um, fear so, fear well, and I money? Get, no, no <laughs> I, think, I, I do think there is huge cynicism within companies. You've got mm. the chief executive and senior management waving their arms around, talking about diversity, how important it is, right? And then on Tuesday, they're in, they're in with one of their direct reports, and all they talk about is, what's the bottom line look like, mm. right? Mm. And I'm sorry that unless the two are connected, Right? You will never, we'll never make progress. And so the discussions you have to have about, are about is, so are we in your division, in your business unit, do we have the talent we need to be successful? Oh, look, it looks like once again, the recruiting group coming in are all the same, right? And your client base is changing, you know, the suppliers are changing, and we're not. So we've got to change with the times. I think if you try and make diversity some extra thing mm. loaded on top, which is different from running the business day to day, you will always be pushing a large rock uphill. It has to be integrated into, here's how we are more successful. The two are aligned. It has to be part of the DNA of the company. Yeah. Absolutely, truly. And, and um, I, we'll talk about it later, but I have um, been recording a podcast series and one person so eloquently put it, he said, you have, the tone at the top has to be absolutely perfect and totally embedded into the management team, but it has to be heard by the bottom and not blocked by the middle. And I thought that was such a lovely way of putting it, but it has to be like a piece of rock right the way through the organisation. And in fact, that's what the figures show, isn't it? That yes, there is activity at the top and, and will and desire, but people thinking that it just doesn't come down to and come to bear any fruit. Um, in fact, only 15% of mid-level managers felt their leaders' actions were consistent with their words. So there's a little bit extra disconnect there. Mm -hmm. So maybe that message at middle level, as Fiona was talking about, is the biggest and hardest job that you have ahead of you. Richard, mm -hmm. how are you talking to your mid-band, well, the big mid-band? Um, I think we've got various ways we can do this. I mean, we have a sort of stated values, <coughs> and I'm sure every company has their values, but it's frankly not about the words written on a piece of paper. It's about making sure you live them. And we have a, a, a rating system for every employee. Um, there's, a, there's a number which says how well you performed in doing, achieving your business results. And then there's a letter that people are rated on in terms of how well they live the values. And so, so we're just going through our mid-year assessment now, then we'll have year-end. And this actually impacts um, how people are paid in the company. So, so, so we do try and 
I don't, know, I don't know yet. A1. I haven't heard the conversation. But, um, <laughs> but um, it, you know, I think it's more than just trying to measure it. I mean, because you can't truly measure the bottom line impact of this, I don't think, very easily. You know, I'm an accountant. I love measuring stuff. But I think you just have to embed this and get everyone to believe it's the right thing to do. Um, and then I think, I think it will show up at the end of the day in the numbers because, you know, clients don't want to sit in front of miserable people. Mm. Clients want to sit in front of engaged people, diverse people, people they can relate to. And, and then they'll do more business with you. And then at the end of the day, that'll feed into mm. the numbers. But you can't make that linkage directly, I don't think. So you can't go from year one of not having diversity issues to year two to really mm. pushing diversity and noticing the difference in the bottom line. It's just right. I wouldn't. It I don't. Work that way. No. I don't worry about that. You don't worry about that. Okay. No. Okay. Um, I mean, the lovely figures about women on boards that we see from uh, McKinsey mm -hmm. and Co, for example, um, showing that you know the bottom line is hugely increased um, by the presence of women on boards, up to fifty percent higher. Um, we can't measure diversity and inclusion so well at the moment, can we? Can we? Well, I think we can. Uh, we change the way we have performance reviews now in our company. We did this in the last couple of years, um, where every time we have a discussion, we talk about two things. We talk about performance, and then we talk about the health of the unit, right? Um, which is a vague term, but it basically talks about um, are the underpinnings of the business going to frankly produce good performance year three, four, five, six, right? So yes, short-term performance, but let's talk about the underlying health of the business. And when you start to have that conversation, it nat naturally leads into, well, is the talent aligned with how the client base is moving? Are you sourcing from all the best talent you possibly could be? That becomes a natural part of the conversation. So you disassociate this issue from how do we do in the last six months, yeah. right? But you do say, it's very clear over the medium term, if we haven't got the right talent, in both diversity and we're sourcing from all the places, we will not perform. And we can definitely show that. Carol? I think that the, the and going on to the, to the talent thing, obviously um, Harvey Nash is, a, is a both a recruitment and a search firm. Um, and we have changed our DNA in, in terms of the way um, that the impact that Inspire, my, the, the network, has actually had, both in the way that the the consultants and the researchers interact with the candidates and the clients. And they do have robust conversations because mm. if, if you ignore 50% of the talent pool, then you're not hiding for nothing. Um, and you know that's, that's just gender. If you take all the other bits as well, then you're significantly reducing your, your talent pool. And that's unsustainable. So I think the way that one of the questions we originally asked was, was you know, how has it impacted on your business? And it's fundamentally changed the way that we actually deliver shortlists, for example. So for us, it, it's been a, a seismic shift. So the, just, just explain mm -hmm. that a little bit more in detail then. So give us an example about how that shortlist has changed or how the way that you interview for positions is different according to each candidate. You mentioned that to me earlier when we were having a, a tea. Yeah, I mean, the, the, certainly in, in terms of the, the um, one of the things that Inspire has taught me so much about um, psychology apart from anything and, and, and how uh, different candidates, both women, men and women, are different. Uh, and up until... Um, 2008, I, I recruited CFOs predominantly, so and 98% of them were men. Um, whereas now I'm, I'm, I'm predominantly women. So it's, it's been a very, very interesting journey for me to actually learn all about um, the different ways people do communicate. And part of the things that I do is, is spend time with, with um, consultants and researchers talking to them about how to actually engage differently, ask the different questions to get the best result in terms of um, the way that women promote themselves, the way that they actually talk about their achievements um, and have a tendency to self-limit or not blow their own trumpet or certainly not project themselves in the same way that a man would. The flip side is I spend um, so much time coaching the women, teaching them how to communicate more effectively. Mm. So for me, it's, it's, it's a fundamental part of it. And you, as, as a, a business, Businesses have to understand that when you actually have an interview panel, it can't just be same old, same old. Otherwise, you will get the mini-me. You will get the same result every single time. Whereas if you actually mix it up and actually have different people on the panel um, who will ask it from a different... And, and that's, I don't just mean gender, I, just, I mean diversity as a whole. Then you'll get a different result. I do think there's, a, there's um, in this process, uh, a little education is helpful too. I had the pleasure of working uh, on the Lord Davis Women on Boards Commission Committee. Um, and early on, when we were doing our early conversations with 
CEOs, chairman, one of their lines, particularly chairman lines, of why this was going to be so difficult was that there are no female candidates. <laughs> How many would you like? <laughs> so we were left slightly, slightly flummoxed by yeah. this. So, so we went, okay, um, and actually just said, okay, well, let's use some criteria. How many roles are we talking about on boards of the FTSE 100 are we talking about? So it's this number. What are the chances that we can find 123 talented women in the whole of the world? <laughs> by the way, the whole world. Right? We weren't just yeah, looking in the UK. Right. Right? It's not right. like and I understand England, yeah. in Britain, 123 <laughs> might be difficult. But when we look around the whole world, surely... Don't get me started. <laughs> right? so, we, so, you know, and uh, oh gosh, you know, there happened to be some. So that was step one. Um, uh, but, but really, there was that was a lot of people said, and very smart people, you know, they weren't, you know, said, no, no, there are no candidates. Um, I think also, um, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I'm involved in the insurance industry, of course, and it is not an industry which has been known to be exactly at the forefront of these <laughs> issues. Um, and a little taking some managers out and saying, why don't we go and visit you know, a high-tech company, mm -hmm. right, where often mm -hmm. just the employee base looks very different, right? You go, because if you live in your siloed industry where mm -hmm. you meet the same people, you <coughs> see the same people all the time, and that is your norm, this is what an employee base looks like. It's when you then go and see a different industry, different geography, so to go, oh, mm. right? It can be quite a shock to the system. Powerful. Power, very mm. powerful. Mm -hmm. It's why, interesting. Why does an organization have to have 15 years' experience in that particular sector? Are you totally unqualified to do a job if you haven't got 15 years? When particularly if you're running a, running a team who hopefully are vaguely competent and do have actually mm -hmm. sex knowledge. Mm -hmm. Why is that actually fundamentally one of the criteria? Which, because it always has been, maybe. Because it always yeah, has been. Which, yeah. which is one of the scary things about banking regulation right now, because yeah. it's, it's moving in a direction of competency, and you have to prove that, mm. that people and are scary. qualified, and, and that might block very talented people from taking jobs. So it's going to be interesting how this plays out. We understand why we need it, mm. but we're going to have to deal with it. It's the same issue with women on boards. It's like, there were no women on boards. Let's get some women on boards. Let's just go and find them. But it, but you can find them, but yeah. it's the pipeline issue, isn't it? And if you block off the pipeline with mm -hmm. regulation or a one-size-fits-all, then it's not going to help feed the chain, is it, with your you know, diverse range and ta of talent? Mm -hmm. um, what answers are there? Are there any solutions to that? Um, can look, you keep on doing what you're doing? I think we've got to keep working at it. I mean, but it's not just about women. If no, I can no. Come back. I yeah, mean, we sort of... No, I was just... Yeah. The, the conversation up. often get... But it's, it's a much broader issue mm -hmm. than that. Um, mm. so, so we've got, you know, LGBT networks, mm -hmm. um, parents and carers for single parents, organisations. We're, we're tackling now disability, which is a really interesting one because you can't really define disability very easily. Some of it's obvious, but some of it is less obvious. So how do you deal with with that for people. Um, so, so we look at it, frankly, very broadly. And um, with the networks, there's just a consciousness in the organization that I think is raised that we care about people as individuals. That's the sort of message mm -hmm. we're trying to get across. So, you know, we have Alex, our blind worker, who, who comes, he gets off the tube at Moorgate every day, gets to the bank on his own. And, and I mean, this. You know, and then he sits down and he's working with colleagues and, and frankly this is pretty inspiring to people. Mm -hmm. so, um, so as an organization I just think we have to be seen to embrace difference, recognize individuals for who they are and, and then gradually I think people will be attracted to join an organization like that. So back to the talent issue, right. it, it, mm. it starts with attracting the right people in but then it it means um, focusing on their needs. So, so we've put in agile working. So you know, we found a lot of um, women who go off on maternity leave struggle initially when they're trying to come back. So we let them work from home three days a week or, or whatever, depending on the role they're in. So. And we talked about measuring the impact of diversity and inclusion in your organization, but can you think, do you audit where people end up? So you may have, 15% of your workforce from an ethnic minority, 8% of them may call themselves disabled. But if they're all cleaning and in the kitchens, then that's not really done the job. But you've ticked a box. <clears throat> Can you see it 
the numbers going out, how do you how do you look and see where people have been deployed? Well, the, the one that everyone, the easiest one to focus on, obviously, is gender, right? Um, and the statistics are usually very poor. The, the, the one which is easiest to follow is, is by uh, grade or level in the organization, mm -hmm. if you like, and you tend to see you know, very high levels at the entry level, right? Uh, and ideally, you'd expect it to be 50-50, right? right? And then as you go through time, mm -hmm. Right, you find that it trails off, and that is a statistic uh, that we monitor and look at very carefully. Um, again, under the heading of what is it that means that we are not doing something appropriate um, to make sure that particularly, as we all, for all sorts of reasons, that women in their early 30s through their you know, 40s decide, not for me, thank you very much. Right? Mm. So what can we do right, to ensure that we don't lose so many women at that, at that period so that they then have the opportunity to rise through the organization. Well, you've got to step back and look very carefully at are actually all your processes, the way the organization works, built around men, in fact, right? right? Not, not consciously, we're going to make this male-oriented. Yeah. It was just, that's the way it was, right? Mm. And you just have to look again. Carol. It's really interesting. We did a report last year called the Balancing Act, and it was it was about why do women opt out? What it's not, they don't give up; they just go and choose to do something different. Um, and the overriding, the, the most the most um, the highest percentage was the cultural thing. They just didn't want to do the corporate politics anymore. They just didn't want to engage, and they wanted to work in a different environment that was more flexible. And I don't talk about a flexible approach. I talk about um, uh, sorry, I don't talk about flexible working, I talk about a flexible approach, because your, your comment earlier about um, what suits the individual. Um, one size doesn't fit all. Um, I, you know, I, I live in Somerset, I work in London, I, li I work globally, <laughs> um, I have two children, uh, and for the last eight years Harvey Nash has just trusted me to do my work when I do my work. Um, it really isn't an issue, and for a woman that's priceless, particularly when you've, when you've got children that are growing up. Um, but for men too, it's not just women, mm. and, and that's the message that I spend so much time going into organisations to talk about. Because, it's, and you're absolutely, both of you are absolutely right. It's, it's for everybody, and if you make, make it right for everybody, then you've got a greater chance of it being the norm. Yeah. Um, because so much of what I've learned, um, whilst I've been doing Inspire, is this is a societal thing more than anything. It's based on culture and society. So, and that's really hard for an organisation to change. Um, and it's a long-term thing. It's not, and, and there's not one silver bullet. And it's so different. And there's so many different things that people have to do. Um, but in terms of in terms of the uh, the women, it's definitely the, the cultural thing. Um, and one, I, I heard somebody speak at another conference I went to um, before, and they said, think of it in terms of the, the the current corporate environment has been built by the baby boomers, and the society that they lived in when they were growing up is very very different to the society that we're living in now. So if you think of it in those terms, um, that's, that in itself is very, very powerful, and it's something that we really have to think about. Okay, just going to pause you there one moment. I'm going to say that in a moment, it's going to be your opportunity to ask the panel a question or put forward a suggestion for the panel, dare I say, um, in how they could do things better or how you could do things better or differently in your workplaces as well. So be thinking of something you may want to ask the panel. But is there an appetite in the city for change? Look, I think there, there is. I, I left the city in the early 80s. It was actually on a three-year assignment, and I didn't come back for 27 years. I, mean, I came back. A long sabbatical. I, I didn't move back for 27 years. I was traveling here. And, and the city I left in the 80s, compared to the city today, is night and day. Right. I, I think. Because, and, and, and maybe I observed it because I wasn't living through a gradual mm. change. It's the sort of frog in the hot water, whatever that thing is. So I, um, I really notice it's, it's more international, it's more diverse, yet we're not there yet. We, we, we're not declaring victory, but there's a big change in attitude. Any brick walls that you've come across, well, I, Dominic? I, I did exactly the same as Richard. I left the, the city <laughs> in the early, early 80s and lived everywhere else and then came back, and again, exactly the same. I'll, I'll give you a, a little... Um, uh, Frisson of that. I was having uh, lunch about uh, a couple of weeks ago with my father, who is, as you would guess, is in his 80s, right? Um, and um, into the uh, dining room, we were at a restaurant, we were in, was a friend of mine, so I got up and shook his hand and said hi. Happens to be a, uh, 
a black man. Right? Uh, and I sat down, and he said, well, who was that? He said, well, he's the CEO of Prudential. Tijan, right? Um, and my father, you know, just <laughs> practically, you know, with, you know melting. melting, right? Right? Um, but, um, which is, in, I mean, Tijan happens to be a very prominent leader of, on multiple levels, but it is indicative of how much change has taken place. I think the biggest barrier we have is the, any disconnect we make. Again, I'm going to be boring on this topic between this topic being some standalone topic as opposed to being how you run a good business. Because if it's a standalone topic, independent of how you run the business, it will fail. and it will also get enormous cynicism mm. in that middle you were talking about, mm. right? This is some crusade that those at the top have the time to conduct, and it's got nothing to do with my day-to-day -day life. If we let that happen, uh, we, will hit, we will hit a brick wall. That's what will happen. Carol, it has to be measured and it has to be an integral part of business. And it has to be some, and everyone has to take responsibility for it. Measuring, anyone got any questions on measurement? How to measure the impact? Fiona, <laughs> I can't ignore your question, can I? She is not, she is not allowed to. Oh no. No questions from the Lord Mayor. She's done a plant, it's okay. No questions from the Lord Mayor. Measurement is, is actually what we want to look at, um, just the, the practicalities of it and how people do it um, and how people implement the values that lie behind the measurements. Now, Richard talked about having, having a set of values that Standard Chartered lives, um, and I'd like to know how you, um, how you, how you, how you construct those values and, and measure against them. Mm -hmm. The, 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 the thing that people keep saying to me is, you know, we, we get, to, you know, we've got eight KPIs. It's a, we're, we're evaluated on how well we manage our teams, the, um, the attrition rates, uh, they do the measure the uh, effect of the exit interviews. Um, we have uh, uh, volunteering and CSR. I know Standard Charter has very powerful, strong ethos on that that's very mainstream to you. Um, and all credit to you. Um, but actually, we, of course, we do know that really what, what management values most is the income. Um, and, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a great rainmaker. I'm very good at pulling in the next job. My income figures are great. Um, and I'm absolutely bruising with my team. Um, actually, you know, would you kick me out? So I think, this, uh, I, I think this gets back to this performance and health conversation. Right? Um, you cannot deny right, that the team leader is producing great results. Right? If you, well, you're going to look at the numbers, right? Um, I think if you have a conversation, now here's the second perfectly legitimate business conversation I want to have with you, which is the health of your business. Right? And the way you are acting with your team, your inability to attract talent of all sorts, daddy, 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 is a major problem. Right? And that's a legitimate business conversation. Not a, because you're, you're talking about a bruiser you're having the conversation with. So if you start doing the sort of flower power thing, it's not going to work, right? <laughs> right? So you're going, this is a business conversation, and the way you are running the business is not effective for the future. So let's talk about what we're going to do about that. That is a conversation which you can get the most hard-nosed, um, narrow-minded person to have to engage with you on, mm. right? And again, I think that's the way to have these conversations. It depends by individual, obviously, but, but if you talk in business terms with individuals who only want to talk in what they think are business terms, right, you can engage with them. Hello. Jack Welsh, uh, who many people have heard of, and he wrote some interesting books and articles. He had a, it was really simple, it was a two by two matrix that he would rate people on. And, and the vertical axis was, is the individual making their numbers? And the horizontal axis was, are they doing it the right way? Are they living the values? And, and he'd plot people in one of four boxes. So the person in the top corner is easy to deal with, making the numbers, living the values. The bottom corner is pretty easy. Not making the numbers, not living the values, pretty easy. What do you do with these two people? Um, making the numbers but not living the values, or living the values but not making the numbers? And his answer was, you have to get rid of this person, because sooner or later, 
they'll get you in trouble and they're disruptive to the organization. The person that's living the values that, but not making the numbers, you give them another chance. Yeah. And, and it, it's a pretty simple sort of diagram, but it really, when I read it, hit home to me the importance of, of living the values and doing the right thing. To some, though, that will be seen as really quite progressive thinking, won't it, in some organisations? Is that um, right? Carol, I you're nodding. I, I, I guess, but, you know, <laughs> I think people I interact with, I don't know about Carol and Dominic, I mean, I don't see a big um, gap these days. I mean, I think, <laughs> I think organisations gen that I deal with generally get it. I but think would they say they weren't, though? Sorry? They wouldn't stand at a party and go, oh, I don't really get this diversity thing. No you, way. You would be Not amazed. in our organisation. Mm. You would They're, be truly amazed at some of the conversations I do have. Go mm. on. They are. <laughs> 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 I, I, I do spend a lot of time with, with, with management teams and boards and whatever, and, and some of the, just some of the, and it is unconscious bias mainly, it's, it's not intentional, um, mm. but some of the, some of the um, comments that, that come out, um, and to give you an example, um, I was, I was um, at a pitch one, um, a year ago, it's only a year ago, and one of the, and it's all, all men, and one said to the other, um, would you put up with a woman? <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, I, I didn't quite know what to say at that point. And, and to give him his credit, the, the, the chair did actually, say, he, he sort of looked at him and it was perfect put down almost. He said, um, yes, my wife would kill me otherwise. Mm. And I got absolutely brilliant, but just to make the point. But the, the, in terms of uh, some of the things that people say, um, one chap said, well, why isn't it okay for, for, for us to um, call a meeting at 7.30 on Friday? Evening, that was. And I said, well, think of it another way. Who is at home supporting you to enable you to do so? Mm. And it was a real shocker to him. He'd never thought of it that way. And it's, it's actually just making people think um, and, and think of things in a different way. How old was this character? <laughs> Depressingly, only in his 30s. Oh, wow. Mm. Oh, boo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's, and it is stunning. So you are progressive. Yeah. We have another couple of questions. So we'll go to the lady in the turquoise there. Oh, I sounded like Dimbleby then, didn't I? <laughs> Sorry. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name's Christina and I interview inspirational women. And I come from an arts background. And so to me, talent <laughs> tends to be things like music, language and culture. And um, in education, we're looking at the cultures that people come from. And in global terms, you want people who can speak lots of languages. I was interested, Richard, in talking about going to an IT team, and I was thinking maybe to go into some of the local inner London schools and have a look at what they have. Because for me, as an educator, diversity is who are you? What can you do? What matters? What do you leave behind? And if two of my inspirational women actually are involved in opera, now I'll bet that's not on your question sheet. Interest in music, do you play an instrument? But yet, Benjamin Zander, the American businessman, sorry, conductor first, businessman second, and he does training courses. Mm -hmm. And we're talking in, a globe, in global terms now. So, you, so being in the English as a second language, being a disadvantage, is in fact, there are numerous people in this country who speak between five and seven. Mm -hmm. and, and so that has got to be of great use to you. My cousin speaks Japanese and, and Mandarin. So that sort of culture, and it's, it's got to come out of education. So... Mm -hmm links with education and talking about how they see diversity, all of the various aspects. Mm -hmm. And I suspect if someone is, I don't know, in a wheelchair or something, they're unlikely to come up on your short list. Mm -hmm. So I just want to throw that into the mix, really, and see if that is... Carol, you're the headhunter amongst us. You've come across a wide range of candidates, potential candidates. Um, arts and background, diversity in another way, another sense of just not fitting those initial six, seven criteria... Do you depressingly not um, seek inspiration from those areas in any way? Well, it's interesting because when I when I interview people, um, I always try and out, try and find out about the human being, um, because so much of what I do is is the chemistry between the, the CEO and the CFO, um, or the, the CEO and the chair. Um, so actually, what drives and motivates an individual to me is equally important as to the experience that they've actually got. Um, and what I do is I obviously take the brief, but then merge all of the other information that I've got because for me all of the non-verbal stuff that subsequently happens at the interview those people connect because that's what they're interested in and that's the irony it's never in the brief but actually it's fundamentally important. Richard? Um, I, I agree with that I think um, 
back to the, I think, the, the issue at hand, languages. Uh, we operate in 70 countries around the world, mainly in Africa, Asia, Middle East. So, you know, we obviously we have to have language abilities. Um, in, in terms of schools and, and communities, we, we do a lot of work with Marion Richardson School in Tower Hamlets here, which is 85% Bangladeshi. Um, so we have staff going along there doing financial literacy. Um, I was painting a room like a, it was supposed to be a pirate ship, I think, <laughs> one day. But so, so we do try and... Up? Sorry? <laughs> what did it end up as? Not very good, as I recall. <laughs> But I think, look, it's all, it's all part and parcel of it. And I, and I agree with Carol, when we, we talk to candidates and then when we hire them, um, we want to know what else they're interested in. So we run 14 sports and social clubs. One, we have a choir in our bank for people who want to do music. Um, so it, it is pretty important. And I, I hate this term, work-life balance, because it suggests that work isn't part of your life. And, and so I think to us it's more balance in your life, which includes work and includes family and includes your interests. And so, you know, we try and give people the opportunity to do some of that at the office or with colleagues, as opposed to work's where I get my paycheck and then let me go and live the rest of my life here. So we do make an attempt, as I say, I don't think we're declaring victory, but we do make an attempt to give people a richer experience. I think we have another question down here. Is that right, sir? Are you still burning with that question? Great. Okay. You ask it's microphone. Good morning. Yes. Hi there. Um, I'm Jalai Khan. I'm 21. I just recently graduated, and I'm trying to avoid the word diversity because I think it's a cliche term now. It's, it's too. I, I hear all the time what it actually means, and I rather go and issue at hand. And it's a fear that um, these industries they're dominated, and I use the word dominated, by upper middle class, white, narrow-minded men. And that's, that's the issue at hand, and we have to face up to that reality. And the case of diversity is, is good having these people superimposed on, on the front cover, but what are we doing to tackle the culture and the mindset? And I'd like to um, advocate two things, which feeds off to some of your points. One is early, early intervention, because it's not about people graduating like me. It's about teaching young people the culture that you can aspire to go somewhere, and this is the path you can take. Because personally, um, if you look around, I'm probably the youngest person here. Is anyone younger than 21? Oh, no, come on, look come at on. me. <laughs> it, 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 you see, so, you are very young, yes. Yeah, so for me to find out, find out, find out what it's about this place, it shows an limitation that knowledge is not out there, and that's the fundamental, not the knowledge of knowing what to do. It creates everything. So I would advocate early intervention in schools, like what you mentioned, and tackling the corporate culture. So at the top is, I know you guys want, really want to push this forward, but it's the main problem is what's happening in the middle and entering the lower parts of the business. And there needs to be a, a culture which doesn't accept discrimination. There has mm. to be a, a zero culture on discrimination on whatever intersectionality, because you can be many inter intersectionalities, and you can feel that. Even if you get the job, you can, it's not about getting the job past an interview. That's the end to the beginning. It is about the day-to-day -day life experience. So I agree with your work-life balance, because people can be working, but do they really enjoy it? Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering the next step towards this, because this is a really recent phenomenon about diversity and promotion. So I'm now, I'm now labeled as what? BME, whatever that means. Is, is about what happens next? Because I, I don't want to grow up in a world where you're, you're labeled as such and such. So I, I really want to tackle this, um, this um, homogenous mindset and be more progressive. Do you think there may just be a, a passage of time before that, la that language is dispensed with? So Cheryl Sandberg says, soon, hopefully, we will no longer have female leaders. We will just have leaders. Leaders, exactly. Yeah? So is it um, something that is necessary? I mean, Carol, do you want to address some of the points that this young man has mentioned? I totally agree with you. And Thank one you. of the most terrifying um, speech things I've ever done is I went to Hammersmith Academy to talk to all of the um, fifth, sixth, and fifth, fifth and sixth form. And it was in a, a place like this with, with teenagers en masse looking at me, which is truly terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I suddenly realised that the, the, the very sort of speech that I was, I was going to give had no relevance. It was absolutely irrelevant to them. Um, so I sort of tore it up in my head and thought, oh, OK, right. And I've got a 13-year-old, so I thought, oh, I can talk to them, it's all right. Attention spans of gnats and lots of lots of phones. Um, and I said, OK, if you're only going to listen to them, I know you don't want to be here, and I know you've got lots of other things to talk about, but if there's one thing that I want you to listen to, listen to this. Listening to this bit will, will 
really increase the amount of money you'll make in your lifetime. Ka-ching. They all <laughs> <laughs> and they all sat and, and, and listened. And, and then I, I had also a, a seminar for um, some of the girls, funny enough, um, afterwards. And I still mentor a couple of them now. And I know that it's a game changer. And I, when I go out to businesses, I always um, encourage them to go to schools. Not, not even fifth form, earlier than that. So that they can understand what the opportunity is. is and so that the, and the individuals from the businesses can get used to talking to people en masse. It doesn't matter what colour, ethnicity or, or whatever they are. It's just people. It's children. And then it's young adults. And then it's the graduates. And that's what we need to do. Let's take another question from over here. Hello, good morning. Good morning. I'm uh, Limbert Spencer. I'm a consultant. I've been working in this area for um, more years than I literally can remember. Um, <laughs> I want to make a statement and then ask a question, if I may, Please. very briefly. Um, extraordinarily talented uh, women and minority ethnic people are being recruited to sit alongside ordinarily talented white middle-class peers. That's the statement which you can agree with or disagree with. The question is, if the statement makes sense for you, how can we get better at enabling ordinarily talented women and minority ethnic people to sit alongside their ordinarily talented white middle-class peers? Excellent question. <coughs> Come on, then. <laughs> <laughs> Give him an answer. A, a gay friend of mine said to me, it was the most magnificent comment, he said, um, Carol, you will know when you've finally arrived and succeeded when a distinctly average woman gets a top-notch job. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful, wonderful quote. But in all seriousness, um, yes, you're right. Yes, we have to get better at it. But it is a long journey. Um, and just, just hearing um, you guys today is, is so wonderful to actually hear. You, you, and the puzzled look on your face that, is, is, seriously, is this really progressive? Because it's normal for you. Mm. And, and my comment earlier about it being part of society and cultural norms and acceptable norms, until we actually shift those, and they are changing, but until we actually shift those, then this is a long journey. But my comment earlier, it's reaching out to everybody at all ages so that it becomes a normal conversation, and then we'll actually shift the dial. I think, the, I think we have to recognize a, 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 a global reality, which is if you go, uh, I think like Richard here, we had the uh, luxury of, of being able to work in different parts of the world over our careers. And the local bias, um, or the bias of that where you are, applies everywhere. So, like it or not, if you go to certain parts of the world, you will find that um, the ordinary, but, I mean, I can tell you, you, go to parts of Southeast Asia, right, and some very ordinary people, because they're local, get jobs over extraordinary people because they're not. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's the way, the way that world thing. works in that part of the world, right? Yeah. So that is a global problem, right? Um, uh, I think we have, uh, we obviously in this country and in North America, we have, uh, there is you know, historic bias to one part of the population, right? I think it is gradually breaking down. It is time, right? Um, but I think uh, you, if you take Richard's comments about what the city was like in, only in the 1980s, which sounds like a long time away, but it's actually in the history of time is a, not a long There's time. only one economic cycle away, wasn't it? The change is unbelievable, <laughs> right? And I think we will be sitting here, and they play a video of this seminar in 2040, and people will, will not believe mm. <laughs> that those stupid people up, and think, well, we were up on the podium were saying what they were Thanks. saying, right? Because it will seem so odd, yeah. right? Hopefully. So odd. Hmm. I mean, I, and, and by the way, I think we ought to recognize we do get slightly stuck here on basically gender and a little bit on ethnicity, other two, right? And our firm faces a very interesting challenge. I'll give you another sort of diversity challenge. The leadership of our firm is either American or British, right? And now the equivalent of Richard's job for us ahead of Europe is a Spaniard. How, how, how extra, extravagant is that? Right? <laughs> we have the opportunity, which we, you know, everyone assumes we will do, to buy the largest uh, player in the French market, which also has a very large network in Africa. And we will inherit a very large number of very senior French executives, right? who legitimately we should leverage 
across the, you know, right across the organization. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let me give you a little cultural history here. France and the UK and America. <laughs> it, um, uh, but that is actually, in terms of diversity, right, will be a very interesting and I think extremely positive thing for our organization, right, mm -hmm. to start to have, you know, everyone thinks, as I say, of the traditional thing. Diversity is much more complicated than that. Okay, and we've got a few more minutes before we wrap up. I'm going to take a question over here. If, uh, if it's brief, that would be wonderful as well. Yeah, sorry, David uh, Wiglin from Willis. Um, it was a question regarding the pay gap. So not necessarily gender related, but across everything, ethnicity and, uh, and what have you. Um, what is the pay gap figures like? Is it closing? And um, what are the factors contributing to that on the assumption you are hiring talent purely, regardless of what group they land in, um, are they being paid the same at the moment? Just briefly, is, if you may. Is this the pay gap between men and women, or pay gap between senior and junior so people? Pay gap between, uh, on, on the same level of uh, management or employee, both men and women, or less able bodies, able bodies or ethnic groups, um, and is it, is it an issue around the globally as well? Yeah, it's... Um, Look, I think some of this is difficult to measure. I think the gender one is easy, because yeah. it's, it's, you know if someone's male or female, more or less. I mean, there's, you know, we have, we have an LGBT network, so, you know, but, but anyway, people have stated either male or female, and you can measure the gap, and we do that, and we look for bias and at each level and try and make sure, particularly in the bonus rounds at the end of the year, there isn't a bias between the two. So that, that we focus on consciously. Much more difficult when you get to ethnicity, religion, disability, it's because people don't, don't declare necessarily. We don't have the data. It's not, it's mm -hmm. not in the system. And okay. so, so it's a challenge. But I think it's, it gets back to treating people fairly, rewarding them for the job they did, rewarding them for living the values, regardless of other characteristics that they have. Okay. Um, is your question very brief, sir? Do you have a question? Yeah. Yes. Um, we talk a lot about companies and what needs to be. Um, we talk a lot about companies and how they um, recruit talent, but how um, do you think it turn changes with these startups, particularly things like Facebook, <coughs> Twitter, um, eBay, Amazon? They're all run by, all started up by white, um, middle class, you know, younger people. Why do you not see a greater diversity in that sort of area as well? Um, because there shouldn't really have been any grading prior, you know, that's, that's the real kind of green shoots of, uh, of people. I think there's a, a deep, deep irony that if you actually look at the board of GE Capital, it is far more diverse than Facebook or Twitter. Mm. <laughs> and uh, just that alone is stunning. Um, why does it happen? Whew, you, you can go on for hours about that. Um, we but, don't have but, and we don't have ours, <laughs> thankfully. Um, but you know, at, at the end of the day, it does happen. It's reality, um, and we have to sense check it, and we have to communicate, and that that is the very crux of it. We have to keep talking about it, and we have to make it an integral part of what we do. Okay, one final word, very quickly, from all of you. What um, could you say to your peer groups to influence them to take and follow your steps in the way you approach business and talent and diversity? Yes, we still have to use the word. <laughs> um, I think when you're hiring, make sure you get a diverse slate of candidates. Okay. And then once you've hired them, treat people individually how they want to be treated. Okay. Dominic? Go out and visit a very different type of company. Okay. Carol? Um, I heard a, a lovely quote yes, uh, on Tuesday or Wednesday evening, which some of you will also have heard, uh, from Liz Bingham from EY, and she said, we have to lift as we rise. Lovely way of putting it. Okay, so it's not an individual task. No. Great. I hope you've thoroughly enjoyed that chat. It has been really exciting to hear from leaders in the field doing and living the dream, <laughs> for want of a better word. I'm going to thank the uh, panel very briefly now. Carol Rosati at Harvey Nash. Thank you. Dominic Cassily at, at Willis. Thank you. And Richard Holmes from Standard Chartered. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you for your questions as well. And thank you to Fiona for having the event this morning and to the appeal. I'm going to leave you in the capable hands of Charlotte Sweeney now, who's been leading the Power of Diversity project for the Lord Mayor. I think we could give our panel a round of applause.
just a few quick words from me as to um, next steps before you go back upstairs and, and get some more coffee and, and, and croissants. First of all, thank you very much, Penny, for for chairing this morning. That Pleasure. was great. Really, we do appreciate that. Um, you'll see on the flyers that you've got that at the bottom it says, join us for the final Power of Diversity Breakfast, the transformation on the 25th of September. And that's where we'll be pulling a lot of this content together around what are the very practical actions and what are the practical measures that organisations can pull together. And we've been working very closely with our sponsoring organisations to, to work through some of that content. So please put that date in your diary. It does say final breakfast, but I think you heard from Fiona this morning that that won't be the last you hear from us. There'll be, there'll be more going on um, post end of mayoralty. So that is, is great to hear. Um, we are in the final stages of creating the Power of Diversity website. And I was just having a quick look around the room to see if Henry Davis was here. No, Henry's not here. Henry's working with us on um, creating the website and we're pulling a huge amount of content together from organisations telling us what they're doing and the impact it's having on their business. So if you would like um, your organisations to be included in that and you have some stories to tell us, please let us know and we'll speak further with you about of getting that onto the web websites. Um, and finally, just a, a big thank you to me for the, from me from the organisations that have been supporting us throughout the year. And if you would like further information, if you are an organisation that hasn't been um, um, involved in the Power of Diversity programme yet, but you would like to be involved further down the line, please seek us out and let us know and we'll give you further information of our plans for later on in the year. So thank you very much. Enjoy another coffee and a croissant. Thank you.